to this webinar about harmonised data for comparative research. My name is Jen Buckley and I'm a research associate with the UK Data Service and University of Manchester. And I've organised a webinar on behalf of SESTA, which is a consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. I'm joined by Professor Irina tomescu jabro from the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology at the Polish Academy of Sciences and by Dr. Christy Winters from GASIS Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences. Okay, so moving on to the outline for today's session. So the premise is that in order to do comparative social science research, we need comparable data across countries. As part of CESDA's work around the archiving and reuse of existing social science data, we'll include issues around working with existing data and especially survey microdata. I will start with a very brief overview of some of the comparative data we already have available. Then Irina will move the focus onto the process of harmonising data from separate cross-national survey projects. Then for our final presentation, Christy will address the process of harmonisation and how we document data harmonisation work. We will then have time for your questions. In the webinar, you will be on mute. To ask a question, you need to type it into the question box. The question box is in the control panel. If you cannot see the question box, you can try checking the control panel is maximised by clicking on the arrow. You can type your questions at any point and we'll come to them during the question session at the end. So how do we get comparable microdata across countries? There are two main options. We can collect new data cross-nationally, and here harmonisation efforts can be focused on common concepts, instruments, procedures that we use, or we can also focus on achieving comparable outputs. Then there is the option of ex post harmonisation, where a comparable data set is made by selecting information from different sources. And crucially, we're seeing more and more international databases being made available to researchers through all of these different approaches. First, um, there are many explicitly cross-national surveys. So these have the aim of achieving comparable data. And many of these are large collaborative endeavours that have substantial infrastructure to support data collection, processing and dissemination. So a key example is the European Social Survey, which is probably known to many of you. Running since 2002, it's a key source of data on attitudes, beliefs and behaviour patterns. The survey is developed by expert teams and then implemented by national coordinators. And there's a very extensive methodology section on the ESS website that provides all the details of the harmonisation work. SHARE, the survey of health, ageing and retirement in Europe, is another example. So this is a panel database of micro data from people aged 50 and above. And it collects data on topics such as health, finances, employment and social networks. It might also be useful to note at this point that both um, the ESS and SHARE are due to recommence fieldwork and have developed or are developing at the moment additional questionnaires relating to experiences during the pandemic. So giving us some sources of comparable data about this time. SHARE is also a member of a family of ageing studies based on the US Health and Retirement Study. There is comparability across the studies and there's been a project called Gateway to Global Aging Data and this is a substantial project to harmonise this family of HRS studies. So there's an online platform to help you navigate the contents and see where there's comparable variables. And there's also um, harmonised data sets that have been created and these are accessible um, along with some of the original studies or they can be created using a data program that you can get through Gateway to Global Aging Data. Cross-national data sets are also being created through collaborations to develop survey modules that then fit into individual national surveys. So the Z International Social Survey Program is an example of this approach. And in this case, um, GASIS in Germany produce and then provide access to the integrated data set. 
A similar approach is used for the comparative study of electoral systems too. There is also some standardization and harmonization across survey projects. So for example, many surveys use international classifications such as the ISCO codes for occupation. We've also seen um, the CERIS project, which has been a big collaboration between the big research infrastructures. And it's worked uh, as one of its aims on improving comparability of measures across surveys. So for example, uh, the project supported cooperation between the ESS, uh, which is European Social Survey and the European Value Survey, to use the same approach to coding education. It is also developed and shared other survey coding modules. So there are many more cross-national survey projects beyond the few that I've mentioned here. However, they're not always easy to find. So I'll briefly go through some resources from CESTA to help with finding and accessing data. So first, there is a CESTA web directory on international surveys. So this is a directory that lists continuous international survey research programs that have accessible data. And they give the description and then links to where you can access the data. For a longer term perspective, uh, GASIS have also got a chronological overview of comparative studies, um, which was last updated in 2015. The CESTA website lists um, the major European data archives with links to their data catalogues. And there is also a CESTA data catalog. So this is a newish tool that includes records from European archives. The records um, provide detailed descriptions of the data collections and then link through to where you can access the data. And there's also a European question uh, and variable bank in development, which will allow you to look for survey questions and variables across surveys and countries. Returning to sources of data, another notable source of harmonized data is microdata is Eurostat, so the Statistical Office for the European Union, and it provides access to the microdata from projects such as the EU Silk and European Labour Force Survey. So many of these databases are developed through um, ex post harmonization with countries implementing their own approaches to achieving these target variables. Eurostat provide access to the microdata um, to researchers at approved organizations um, through an application process. Another area of cooperation and harmonization relates to some of the big national household panel surveys. So many of these household panel surveys cover similar comparable topics and there's been a project called the cross-national equivalent file um, or the CNEF which details equivalently defined variables um, that relate to things like demographics, income, employment and health. The project provides both a simplified version of the panels for cross-national analysis and then also guidelines for formulating equivalent variables across countries. And finally, here are some um, other extensive ex post harmonization projects that all either make sort of data or some data resources available. So first, Liz is a long-standing harmonization project that harmonizes data sets relating to income and wealth. And access to the microdata here is via a remote uh, access service due to some of the confidentiality uh, agreements that are in place. There has also been work to harmonize time use studies that use comparable design um, through both a Eurostat project and then there's also a project called the multinational time use study. The International Stratification and Mobility File is another project to create a comparative database and this is focusing on social mobility patterns. And this project is really notable for its inclusiveness, so there's been more than 250 surveys included. And the project also provides files to create comparable social stratification measures.
Finally, my ending point is the Survey Data Recycling Project, uh, which is a multi-country, multi-year database with a thematic focus on political engagement, trust and social capital. And this project is led by our next speaker, Irina. Just before I pass over to her, for anyone interested in more on these data sources, the reference here is to a paper by Irina and a colleague that examines the history of ex post harmonisation in the social sciences. There's also a handout with the information and links I've presented here in the handout section um, that you should be able to download um, through your control panel. So anyway, thank you for listening and I will now pass over to Irina. Uh, hello, thank you, Jen, for, um, uh, for uh, giving uh, the opportunity that uh, we share uh, experiences with ex post harmonization of cross-national survey data that we accumulated in the SDR project. I say we because the SDR project is a collaborative effort of researchers at the Polish Academy of Sciences and the Ohio State University to study political participation, social capital and well-being in comparative perspective. So yes, I voice many other voices to uh, give a brief overview of how an existential question plays out in SDR. Now, what's the question? Well, in life we encounter often what is uh, the current state. Uh, but we also know that there's something better out there, what should be. And then the puzzle is how can we successfully move from what is to what should be. Uh, for us in the SDR project, what is um, constitutes a, a wide range of international survey projects, 23 to be precise, that all contain individual level um, measures of um, uh, substantive interest to us and of course their correlates but separately these projects do not cover well countries um, at different levels of um, democratization and economic development stages so while we know that behaviors and attitudes depend on the characteristics of the countries that we live in if we take only one given project, even if it's the World Value Survey or the International Social Survey Project, there is limited geographic and time coverage of this data. So then we move into what should be or what, what, uh, what we could have. And what we could have is um, a data research infrastructure that integrates uh, the information on the substantive variables with um, so from these different projects. So then what will happen is if we have uh, multiple data sets within each of the survey projects that contain the measures of interest and uh, we can uh, pull them, then what we want to achieve, what should be there is a data set where coverage of people and countries and years uh, widens. And what is essential, Respondents' answers pulled from different national surveys are comparable. So here comes then the question of, uh, or the puzzle, okay, how do we move from what is to um, what should be? And our answer in SDR is uh, to develop ex post survey data harmonization methodology. Now, methodology is a tricky concept because it refers both to theory, uh, what is the logic behind doing things in a certain way, and it also ref refers to the practical steps of doing these things. I will first outline the theory dimension and then give a brief overview of the practical workflow of ex post harmonization that uh, goes uh, in terms of the logic and the steps beyond, uh, beyond uh, SDR. And actually we noticed uh, with ple pleasant surprise that uh, when we were looking at the Maelstrom project, which is also a major um, source of harmonized data on, on health behaviors, that actually independently of each other, we came up with a very, around the same time in 2015, 2016, with pretty uh, similar um, outline of, uh, of um, how to play with this kind of, um, of data and, and endeavors. Anyway, 
Now, sticking with, uh, with the methodology from the theoretical point of view, what we do in SDR is to go for methodology that allows to account for the fact that the surveys we selected deviate to varying degrees from common standards of documentation and processing. That seemingly same question items have varying properties and that actually harmonization itself could introduce additional errors. If we are thinking, for example, in the process of stacking data, we may add uh, uh, errors of variables from different surveys. So with such an approach to, uh, to the understanding of exposed harmonization, what we are doing is to extend uh, or to yes to extend the definition of exposed harmonization methodology so that it encompasses the the um, properties and the pro I'm sorry the, the, it encompasses the procedures to achieve or at least strengthen the comparability of measures of the same concept taken from data sets that were not a priori designed as comparative which is the classic definition in the literature and we include the methods to define and measure methodological variability that comes from what? From unequal quality of the source data and from harmonization as such. Now, the logic of doing that in the nutshell is that uh, such variability can weaken the validity and the reliability of the harmonized target variables and should be, hence, this kind of methods should be integrated with the strict measures of transforming source variables into target variables. Informed by this uh, analytic framework, in the SDR database, we have two types of variables. We have target variables. These are the technical variables that allow to identify technical information, project name, interview year, survey year, and so on. And then we have about 24 uh, target variables that correspond to uh, concept or concepts of substantive interests and they deal with uh, respondents' behaviors, their attitudes and opinions, and of course, uh, sociodemographics. And uh, I put uh, the first link there where one can see uh, exactly the full list of variables that we are currently working on, because maybe I should mention that this is still work in progress, so we have not yet finished the second version of the database. What I would also like to emphasize here is that in the process of creating harmonized target variables, what also get ha gets harmonized is the missing code schema for each target variable. And this itself um, has uh, its own uh, beauty of playing with. Now, in uh, SDR, the way we think about target variable is that they are a linear function of, um, of uh, source variables. But the form of the relationship between the target variable and the source variables has to be determined by the researchers. That's one. And why? Because it depends on the substantive research question that somebody has. And it depends on the availability of the source variables. So basically what this means is that the relationship of target to function could vary across survey projects and survey waves. Moreover, what we are also considering is that the relationship of the target variable, in other words, the, the target variable being a function of the source variables, in addition, it may be also impacted by the methodological variability that differences in quality of the source data and harmonization procedures per se add, um, add to uh, basically um, the outcome. So therefore, one needs to account for, for these methodological errors and biases, so to say, uh, in order to uh, strengthen the validity and the reliability of the target variable. So this is why uh, in the SDR database, we also have next to the substantive target variables that have been harmonized and the technical variables, which are common in, I would say, any harmonized data set that, or data set that has been harmonized exposed, we also have uh, two sets of methodological variables. The first set are harmonization controls. And these harmonization controls come with um, a given target variable. So they are target variable specific. They are created during the process of transforming source variables into target variables. And the idea is to capture features of the source items and of the harmonization process 
<coughs> that could introduce measurement error. But at the same time, also to preserve as much information about the source variables, because we know we cannot distribute the source variables, to preserve as much information about the source variables around the target variable. Because one of the things that we know oftentimes that is a criticism that is leveled uh, at, at uh, exposed harmonization is that um, we throw out information as we try to reduce uh, the data to the common, uh, to the least common denominator. And I was giving here some examples of uh, harmonization controls that we are creating. Some uh, deal with the meaning of the source variables uh, across different dimensions, time. So for example, people are asked, have you participated in demonstration? Well, they are asked, have you participated last year? Have you participated in the last five years? Have you participated ever? Uh, they deal with the meaning and uh, a, a different dimension of meaning is space. People are asked, have you participated in your community or have you participated in your place of living? They deal with the scope. Uh, the meaning also deals with scope. So, for example, you are asked, have you participated in demonstrations or you are asked, have you participated in demonstration, marches and rallies and so on. Then, of course, there are former properties of scale measures. Uh, and what I would also like to say is that sometimes, like with any other manipulation of variables, we may derive values on the target variable from a different source variable. So not necessarily from the source variable of age, but I, if age is missing in a given source data, I may still derive values on the target variable if birth year for respondents is available. So this kind of properties of the, of the um, source items and of the harmonization process are defined and measured and stored as variables in the SDR database. And the second type of, uh, of uh, methodological variables are source data quality controls. These, uh, the purpose of these variables is to capture biases and errors that come from different uh, amount, or from differences in, differences in the quality of the source data. Now, survey quality, as we all know, is uh, a heck of a concept. Uh, the operational definition that we take in SDR draws on total survey error, on survey process management and fitness of intended use to identify three dimensions in which we can um, defy, define, <laughs> defy also the problems, we can define, we can identify by going to the source data and coding the properties of the source data and then basically create indicators along three dimensions, Sur survey documentation, data records in computer files and the degree of consistency between documentation and data, data records, basically whether there are processing errors there. Now, we, for this last one, it's uh, a lot of work, so we do it only for a selected number of target variables, seven of them. And for people who are interested in more details about the construction uh, of these indicators and the logic of them and we, what indicators are available within each direction for the uh, for uh, the second version of the SDR database. I provided uh, the link uh, to a presentation that we delivered in uh, in December, and there are then also publications that one can find from the website. But this is a quick. This presentation gives a quick overview of what is available there. But what is the purpose? What is the purpose of storing this uh, basically metadata, right? There are data about data. What is the purpose of storing this metadata as variables? And uh, um, we are of mm, the, you know, in the, the approach in SDR is that if you have them together with the substantive target variables, you give more research flexibility. Why is that? Well, because one can decide whether one should use or not surveys of varying quality depending on their research needs. They can decide whether source items with certain properties are acceptable for the kind of research that they want to do, again, substantively. Methodologically, we can envision that one can see, okay, what the heck happens to my relationship if I eliminate, for example, those data sets that have um, on variables that are generally measured with seven point scales, what happens if I, if I eliminate the variables that have dummies? For this measure and so on and so forth and what is a very important aspect is actually that if this 
properties are stored as variables, one can add them in substantive analysis of the target variables. So basically, you can include them in multi-level modeling. So this is from the theoretical point of view, how we approach harmonization. Now I will switch to, uh, to the practical and go through the steps that constitute the ex post harmonization workflow. Pointing out that the key elements are, like with any kind of methods, uh, starting from the literature, thinking what the data would be, and not forgetting about documentation, which is a crucial piece for any ex post harmonization project. Now, practically speaking, uh, we hear all the time literature matters. We can say, uh, following Peter Granda and his colleagues, use theory to have a good understanding of what the model is, because that helps you understand what variables you, you will need. It helps you understand whom you want to include in your analysis, and therefore it will help you shape the criteria for data selection. And once one has a good understanding of what the time and geographic coverage in, in the data should be, why I want to take certain data sets but not others, which data sets I want to take and so on, what should the sample representation be, for example, then what is crucial is to set a time zero. What does it mean a time zero? Well, we know that data and their documentation get modified by data producers because improvements are done or because new data are collected. Well, it is very, in, for ex post harmonization to be feasible, it is essential that we, we set the premises, the boundaries within which we work. So then what is, um, what is very important is that one, uh, decides and records this time zero, which basically is the date past which no new or corrected data or documentation would be added to the data to be reprocessed. The next step then is to review the source questionnaires and code books. Why? Well, because we need to understand what source variables fit the theoretical definition of our target concept. It is very tedious work, so uh, we can as well try to make it as useful both internally for the harmonization project and for others. Now, useful for harmonization means what? what? It means that we systemize all information pertaining to source variables that seem at the preliminary inclusive selection to fit the co target concepts. Now, in SDR, for each target variable, we create a report in Excel. We call it detailed variables, uh, source variable report, but it doesn't matter. What is important is that it is an Excel file where we systemize all information about source variable, meaning variable names, labels, uh, values, uh, question wording, and of course, the name of the data set they originate from. And we do that both for the source variables that we initially took and for those that eventually we will leave out because they do, upon closer inspection, they do not fit so well the target concept. And this information, and which takes us back to the documentation, this information we extract from three main sources, questionnaire, codebook, and the data dictionary of variable va uh, labels and values in the source data files, which um, I would mention now, perhaps also later, it is not uncommon that uh, information that should be the same is contradictory across different sources. So the documentation would say one thing, the codebook may say another thing with regards to value labels, for example, or even with regards to uh, categories of answers. Or it is also possible that both the documentation and the codebook say the same thing, but something else appears in the data set themselves. After, um, uh, after this step, um, uh -huh. actually what I would like to say here that I, I mentioned that we are doing it for, uh, this is internally for the project to create a detailed variable report pertaining to the source variables. What we do uh, that should be more useful uh, on, on a wider scale 
is um, a document that facilitates the overview of all 88,000 variable names, values, and labels that are available in the original source data files that we have retrieved automatically for harmonization purposes in the SDR project. We call this file cotton, and we, we call this document, which is an, a, a macro enabled Excel document, cotton file, and it is freely available uh, via Dataverse. So that much for internal and external uh, returns to a lot of work when checking through uh, documentation um, and, and data sets. Then the, the process has to get na to be narrowed down because we have pulled, uh, we have identified a bunch of variables that seem to fit the target concept. So now it's time uh, for teamwork, not that uh, before uh, this wouldn't help, but uh, what is now needed is discussion of how strong or weak uh, the available source items for how we want to operationalize the target concept. So in practice, data availability may force us uh, to redefine the target concept. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is how far are we willing to stretch the definition of the concept? You know, to, to achieve a compromise between what data coverage we want, but at the same time stay within the boundaries of what the literature um, defines this concept to be. Uh, some variable, some source variables will not make this cut. In other words, the, the conclusion would be they, they fit too loosely. So then they would be removed. But what means removal? Removal means uh, obviously putting somewhere else, but with a good track record of the decisions that inform this uh, removal and with a good understanding of where these variables are, because as life goes, sometimes when you take a second look, you realize that actually maybe they were fitting after all. So in SDR, we keep these variables in the detailed variable uh, source variable report in an extra Excel sheet that is called leftovers. Next uh, uh, is the issue of creating harmonization control variables. Maybe I would like to add here that, you know, I'm talking about this as uh, successive steps. Obviously, there is a lot of iteration. Uh, here. So sometimes you have to go back and go forward and you thought you finished a step and then you go on. But, you know, for organizational purposes, uh, we'll talk about linear progression. It doesn't happen like that. Uh, uh, about harmonization control variables, uh, these are those that I mentioned before that they are specific to target variables. So I would not say uh, much about here other than they are created during the process of transforming source variables into target variables. So when we judge how the source variables fit to the target variables and what the mapping of uh, values in the source variable would be to target variables, we also decide what are the features that uh, of the source variables that we want to preserve or what are the features of the harmonization process that we want to preserve. And these decisions and how to preserve it, meaning the exact codes that we assign to harmonization controls, we also store in the detailed um, variable, uh, source variable report uh, that accompanies each target variable. The essential or yeah, the essential piece in order to move from just evaluating the source data to actually creating the, the, the target variables are uh, or is the crosswalk coding. And here we map exactly how values of the source variables are to be recoded, recoded or transformed into values of the target variable. In SDR, crosswalk tables are macro enabled Excel documents. They are the basis for harmonization syntax. They also serve for additional consistency checks. It's easy to, to catch errors in them uh, that perhaps escaped at earlier points. And they also enable a quick insight into data. That is, one can relatively easily do a national survey level distribution for each of the source variable and see whether things fit or not. Now, the last step, uh, after control variables for source data quality, which again here it's only uh, the only mention that would be is that they are created at various stages of the work in, in creating variables because documentation controls would be created much earlier on, is that um, final variable target variables have to be revised and then basically 
the syntax is implemented and the the harmonized data set uh, is uh, um, is established is created with its documentation um, documentation is tedious and we know that uh, users sometimes um, uh, um, are overwhelmed of where to look for and find what they need so while we have the detailed variable reports which are uh, in excel and are the most comprehensive uh, description of how a variable a target variable gets constructed each uh, target variable is also accompanied by uh, a word document that is a general variable report that provides the operational definition of the concept how it is operationalized through the target variable the harmonization rules and procedures the methodological control variables that correspond to these particular variables a variable and that also highlights special cases in the source data that required extra harmonization decisions that where we couldn't stick to the general rules that that uh, apply to the creation of the variable and also provides the reasoning uh, for why this is so so implicit in this work workflow uh, that i just showed is how much of essence is to ensure transparency of harmonization procedures and decisions and of course this is next to sharing harmonized data and its documentation uh, I was saying that now we're working on the second version of the data uh, SDR database. The one is uh, the first one is available in in Harvard database. And for transparency, uh, these four uh, files, the target variable reports, the crosswalk table, and the syntax are essential for uh, the first database. They are available in Harvard database. Then there is the cotton file that um, is uh, transparent also from the point of view that it allows others to judge whether the source variables that we selected in order to construct a target variable are indeed the only ones that could have worked. And uh, um, then there is uh, speaking of, uh, of resource sharing also, uh, there is a harmonization newsletter that we are putting out for a number of years now. So if people do harmonization and uh, are uh, concerned with the cross-national survey data, we invite you to either read it, uh, but more importantly, to contribute your thoughts to it. So on this note, I will, um, I will pass on to Christy quick but not before thanking quickly uh, my colleagues in the SDR team and uh, NSF uh, that um, made our life uh, great and miserable because we definitely can work all this stuff and it's a lot of work so it is uh, no it is it is a great thing uh, a great resource to have thank you well hello everyone and thank you to who to those who went before i want to try to build on this a little bit i'll even turn my camera on to see if that works um uh, to build on this a little bit in terms of a case study we did here at gasis working with the european value survey where we uh, used a software we've developed called CharmStats to help us automatize the process a little bit more. So I just want to go over some basic kinds of concepts initially, and then I will walk you through the use case in terms of what we've developed. And in terms of my page, I, I hope that works out just fine. Okay. No, nope, that's not going to work. All right. So obviously, why do we harmonize? It's necessary for cross-national comparative research. It com contributes to our, our base of empirical knowledge. It allows us to make conclusions with empirical data on a, on a better basis and compare things across time and cultures. Um, but as a consequence of doing international work, you have a lot more information to organize. So just as has been stated before, you need to decide a strategy early on in terms of how you're going to harmonize your data um, into the survey life cycle. And planning is everything. Creating a plan for your harmonization process from the start uh, and knowing where you're going in your steps will really help you create good quality documentation by the end. That's very clear. So there are a lot of practices that we can go through. I'm going to go through this part a little bit faster because some of my previous colleagues have talked about methods, um, steps that you can take in order to 
develop your harmonization process, you know, agreeing on a common definition and doing all of that kind of work. I just wanted to make a nod to these things because this also went into what the European Value Survey does every time that they have to go through a harmonization process, you know, when they do their studies again. So let's jump right into my area, which is the documentation side of it. And at the end of the day, the data um, will be usable to the extent to which people can understand what's going on with your data. And as much as it's not particularly fun, always to do documentation, it's so necessary to make sure there's that kind of transparency and replica replicability in your work. So why do we um, want really good data? Why do we want really transparent data? It's the cornerstone, really, of the social sciences. And as this quote here from more of uh, Morsik says that unless other scholars can examine the evidence, parse the analysis, understand the process by which your evidence and theories were chosen, why should people trust your data and spend time on it? So transparency really gives confidence and allows more people the ability to use the data that you put so much work into. And the documentation is the method by which they will be able to do that. So you can evaluate the data, you can replicate it correctly, not only by having the code, but also by understanding the thought process that went behind it and for better understanding secondary data analysis. So this pressure to document is increasingly driven by the fact that we have more data available and we have better quality data available. So that gives us um, more opportunities to you know, have harmonization needs. Also, with increasingly sophisticated statistical methods, people need to understand the variable construction. And there is sometimes specific information that is Okay, thanks. Just had a little uh, little muting uh, confusion there, I think. So with um, more constructed, more sophisticated, uh, advanced variables or more challenging variables, clear documentation is going to be important for that. So in terms of replication, it's not only important to know how um, a piece of research it exists, but also how it can help you with your research past yourself and developing, uh, using the variables in a right way for your own analysis. So when we talk about documentation, ultimately we're talking about collecting metadata. And as you should probably know by now, but it's worth restating, data is, um, metadata is information about your data. It is study level information. It can be question level, um, question level information or variable level information, the pieces of information necessary for someone to understand what is contained within your data set. And these descriptors facilitate data cataloging and also data discovery. These kinds of pieces of information, your metadata can be stored in a data repository and be transformed into machine readable data, which makes it easier to find and for either um, people to access and use. One of the important things that we try to stress is although the code that you might use in SPSS or in Stata is the actual specific code that you've used to transform your variables, just attaching a do file or attaching a save file is not sufficient. Um, the problem with this is that one, there are no particular rules or conventions about how these codes should be published. And the code might, if you just put in the code, it might not answer the questions people need to know why you coded things the way that you did. As well as the fact that if you are working in Stata and someone else works in SPSS, attaching a do file won't necessarily help them because they can't just port, import that into SPSS. So even though including the code is vital and absolutely important and you have, you know, it's, it's good practice, it isn't it's sufficient. Uh, on its own, it's not sufficient. So ideally, if you have the plan to document your metadata in a consistent way from the beginning, and you can do that throughout the process of your um, your harmonization or your study process, then by the end, when you get to uh, the end of your projects, you'll know exactly what information people will need. And so it won't be scrambling at the end to figure things out in reverse order. There are also important reasons to document, as my previous colleagues have pointed to, in terms of cultural context, linguistic meanings, and various complications that come along with 
uh, harmonizing variables, including informing people about the loss of information that can happen through merging items. So all of this transparency will give more confidence in how people use your data. In terms of the perfect documentation, we would say that um, it should include access to the original data, if possible, or links to where it is stored. It should have the original question wording, information on the survey collection process, the assistance for checkbacks or retransformation plans, and also if there are any restricted data agreements in terms of uh, if you've got you know, some economic data, we have a secure data center here um, at, at GASIS that has um, limit, it limits, you know, like um, the kinds of information that can be accessed to a controlled room as opposed to being published everywhere. So just that information will help people have um, the best understanding of what they're working with. If you want a management plan checklist for your metadata, you can. Uh, this link will be available when the slides go up, but that is available from SESTA, and you can access that information uh, at the, uh, the DMP expert guide there. And now I want to quickly look at the documentation that we produced with the European Value Survey in a, in a recent kind of use case. So this is a little example, but I'm actually going to switch my um, slides here. Okay, right. This was what we developed for the European Value Survey when they wanted to do their harmonization. And with CharmStats, our software, I don't want to go too much into it because there's a lack of, there's a very short amount of time. But the basic premise is that it's a database. It's a MySQL database. We have different levels of metadata. We have study level, question level, variable level, and even value level metadata uh, in terms of how things are coded, like a one or a two or a three if you wanted to make comments. And then we cluster information about the studies under these sort of four headings, study level, metadata, question level, metadata, variable level, data, metadata, and so forth. And what that allows us to do by importing individual pieces of metadata into a database where they each have their own unique address but are thematized, if that makes sense, is that we can pull out information and recombine it in different ways. So what you're seeing in front of you is uh, the detailing on the religious denomination for all countries involved in this particular wave of the EVS. However, we were also able very easily to generate country-specific variables for each harmonized variable simply by pulling up different metadata and recombining it and then formatting it. Um, so before I give too much of a false impression, Charmstats doesn't produce these particular outputs. They produce the text, but the formatting does require a human being still. But when you do a little bit of formatting, you can get a really nice, clear, and hyperlinked document that can be uh, featured alongside the data set. So as you can see here, it's got the name, it's got the related data sets with their DOIs. It gives you a, a little credit here for our software Charmstats, and then it will tell you exactly what things are in the report and where they are. So you can see the various country codes and the country listings. And then we get to the first page where the project itself is described. This is the project name and what its goals are. It tells you the question name, the question number, um, and also the follow-on question. It gives you a description here of the concept. And again, all of these are stored in charm sets, so you don't have to write them multiple times. You just fetch them into the form if that makes sense in terms of like if you think about how a database stores information. And then it comes to the target variable. This is the, the variable to which other things are harmonized and so you get a specific um, uh, listing here of this, the target variable to which all of the source variables, all of the individual country levels uh, variables were harmonized. And then the documentation goes through country by country. So first it tells you the name of the source variable, it gives you the response options and codings, and then we auto-generated, we created this feature where it auto-generates a map, and it fetches, uh, once the harmonizations take place in CharmStats, you can pull up those relationships, those connections between a five and a one, or whatever your numbers happen to be, and pull those into a table. So um, one of the previous speakers mentioned the importance of reporting what happens with missing values don't know, refused, other things. And in, the nice thing about these mappings is that it includes that information as well. So I'll scroll down, but you can kind of see that this just goes very systematically through each of the countries, including the original text, the English translation, and the original target value, uh, variable, sorry, and its name in 
the in the data set. So if you were interested in really getting in deep into how the religious coding worked uh, in this wave of the European value survey, we think that this is a very clear um, presentation of the information you need. Now, I should say not included at the end of this document is the code, but the SPSS code is made available, but just in, a, I think, a different format. So what we found is that it was, um, it, the, the first wave is a lot of work. Getting the information into the database is it's like building a foundation of a house. You know, the foundation, if you set your foundation right, your house will stand for years. Um, if you kind of mess up your foundation, you're going to have to be, unfortunately, doing a lot of extra work throughout, you know, to try to do the things that you should, you know, to make up for what you didn't do at the start. And the same thing with charm stats. The initial importation takes quite a lot of time and investment, but once you've got a system down, then it works quite well. So once you have your um, documentation, you can, you know, it's good obviously to put it out there. Uh, you should really publish your data and your documentation and you should do it according to the FAIR principles, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, replicable. I think that's right. And the R one I always like, rep reproducible or replicable. Um, and using a PID, a permanent identifier, if you have your documentation assigned its own DOI, people won't have to dig inside the study. They'll be able to actually go to, you'll be able to cite your documentation as your DOI. So that definitely helps with transparency and replication. And if you're depositing this documentation along with your study in an archive, then your long-term preservation issues are taken care of. You don't have to worry about dead-end links. And you know the DOI is a well-known and persistent identifier in academia. So yeah, please check out CESTA's Data Management Expert Guide, Chapter 6, which offers information on archiving and publishing if you need any help or advice. So your harmonized data set together with your doc documented metadata um, can be stored in data archives and they will provide a link to the documentation right there. So I've got another hyperlink which will work in the slides when you see them. And the benefits of course of making sure your documentation goes alongside its own, has its own DOI next to your data set is its comprehensibility, um, the visibility, the findability, reusability, the longevity. And um, of course to go, by going through this process you'll have the data archive itself checking for quality to make sure that it's up to standard and up to code. When this is done, when you guys have the slides, I have a series of uh, references here that I will add as well so that you can follow up with more information. But at this point, I am, uh, I am done with my, my presentation. So thank you very much. So we can have time for questions. So um, please just answer your questions in the questions box. Um, so we've got one question, which would be for um, Irina, who was uh, wondering about whether you could talk about any time where it's been really difficult around searching concepts so where you kind of if you could give an example of where you find it sort of hard to to judge whether two questions are measuring the same concept uh, yes I, I would say that one of the most difficult concepts to harmonize and not surprisingly is education Anybody who knows the history of edu harmonizing education in the social, uh, European Social Survey uh, project and has talked to Silke would know uh, what the problems behind it. So behind it are, um, and um, this would be, I would say, on the extreme uh, of the difficulties. But uh, um, so even even place of residence uh, that seemingly is straightforward upon closer inspection of the data you would realize that actually there uh, may not be uh, the possibility to uh, to create the target concept in the way you want so eventually in sdr we settled given again what we're interested in that the, the theory talks about the distinction between people who live in rural areas versus the rest in terms of political participation and well-being issues, social capital also. We settled for rural versus rest. Um, then um, uh, the socio-demographics may appear easier to harmonize, but again, uh, it depends very much on uh on what concept you'd like to create and actually i would like to add one more thing Har ex post harmonization and i think this question was raised by somebody else ex post harmonization uh entails a lot of effort 
And uh, part of the of the questions uh, that come up is, are we doing uh, all this work just for ourselves? You know, just in quotation marks, because uh, it is important that one pursues their research problems. So then what, in a, what may add to the difficulty of creating the target variable is the understanding that your definition or my definition of a given target concept will be different than the definition of somebody else's who may want to study the same or very similar processes, but who want to define the concept, um, who want to define the concept differently. And uh, um, this is uh, the, this, this struggle between making the, the target uh, concept uh, in line with your research needs, but keeping it flexible enough that other people would not have to go and retake the data because what one can publish with exposed harmonized data, what one can share, is only the harmonized database. We are not allowed to share source data. Therefore, one is allowed to provide the, the integrated database with the harmonized measures, where these measures are uh, much uh, narrower, perhaps, than somebody, some other researcher would like them. And here is why uh, I think, uh, and my colleagues also, that uh, harmonization control variables actually allow to build a more flexible boundary around the target concept. Mm -hmm. I can follow up with the next question, but I didn't hear your response there, Irina. So would, was there anything else that you would like to add into this point? No, I do not uh, want to add anything else. I was wondering whether I should uh, talk more about this issue about efforts for a larger versus a smaller project, or uh, maybe part of it was already covered in my previous answer. What means uh, small scale? What means large scale? Uh, we can think about it from two points of view. Uh, how many uh, source data sets you want to integrate and how many uh, target concepts you want to create. Even if I want to create only three target concepts, but I'm taking uh, five source data sets, or I'm taking, I'm still creating only three target concepts, but I'm taking 20 data sets, the work will be there. The work will be there because it is uh, uh, a mandatory prerequisite uh, according to our experience that before engaging in exposed harmonization, one checks the documentation, uh, meaning codebook questionnaires and information in the data sets for each of the source variables that need to be done. So, of course, that the amount of time um, that that projects take grows with the more the the, the number of source data that you want to harmonize, and um, and the number of um, target variables that you want to create. But at the same time, um, once you have done, like Christy mentioned, once you have done the foundation for how you work. So once you have set the grounds for how you select the data, that you have your criteria for how, what, how you uh, approach the um, uh, reprocessing of the source variables, things become a little bit smoother. Um, is it a lot of work? Yes. Uh, I would uh, often joke that with this kind of work that we have done in uh, in SDR, one can feel uh, graduate students and our own life for more than, than a lifetime. I guess it yeah. also depends on how far one wants to go. Um, brilliant. Okay, well, I think what I will do is, um, unless we've got any more questions coming in, um, I'm going to bring this session to a close because I keep experiencing um, connectivity problems. So, um, and we've not got uh, many questions in. So, I'm really sorry about all the problems that have been experienced. Um, if you do want to ask a question, we will make up the time now. So, please do put in a question uh, to us. If I may, if I could just mention perhaps uh, for people who came here for a more introductory overview or are just starting the SESTA training, uh, sorry, the YouTube SESTA training page in about mid-July will have a four-part introduction to variable harmonization 
that features actually the the slides that I did today are taken in part. Uh, they've been a modification of that four part series. And uh, Yannick Brewer and I go over uh, from introduction to a case study like the case study you looked at. So check out the CESDA training YouTube uh, page in sort of like 15th July, 30th July. The video should be up. Okay. That's brilliant. So that's a CESDA YouTube page. Correct. Okay. Oh, yes, yeah, so okay. it says the training. There's two. It's the says the training page. Brilliant. And you okay. So that's for a more introductory guide to um, mm -hmm. harmonization. So again, I'm very sorry for the technical problems at the end of that and, and missing the questions. Um, so what I'd like to do is very much to thank Irina for uh, joining us and to Christy for joining us um, and to, to say goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. This video is produced by the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. For more information on CESTA, please visit www.cesta.eu.